I believe there's a conflicting message with this dynamic because you have the kids saying, back off, you're overbearing, but in the same breath, they say, hey there, welcome back to the Mind Your Boundaries podcast, episode number 12. I'm your host, Jessica Miller, and I'm so happy you're here today because we are going to continue our discussion talking about adult child estrangement. Now, back in episode 10, yeah, episode 10, we started. We started talking about it. I shared a simple three-step reunification process that I would do, and you guys had questions. You wanted more details, like how do you get them to crack the door? So that's what we're diving in today. If you missed episode 10 and you want to know what causes estrangement, what are the leading causes, what's the current trend, why are so many young adults estranging from their parents, go back to episode 10 and you'll get all the details there. One note, we are not talking about, like when we're talking about estrangement and when we're talking about a reunification plan, we are not talking about the circumstances or situations where your adult child has estranged from a parent that was clinically, this is a clinical diagnosis, physical, mentally, emotionally, sexually, I think I got all of them, any type of abuse. We understand why you estranged. So that is not who we are talking about. The subgroup we're mainly focusing on is what's driving the silent epidemic in America today, which is the group that there's a shift in values in generations. So like from generation, uh, Gen Xers to millennials and Gen Zers, we think differently and we're not getting on the same page and we misunderstand how to create healthy boundaries. So when they're crossed or what we think is a boundary, we don't know what else to do because we keep thinking our boundaries are being crossed and we get to the point where we just cut off. And I think by having these conversations and really understanding what a boundary is, how to set and hold a boundary, it will help families stay connected and also heal this divide that you're in right now. And right now is so confusing because as a parent, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I wanna do everything I can to get my child back in my life immediately. And so you are on overdrive trying to figure out what can I do, what can I do, because all the sirens are going off in your body. But at the same time, you're thinking, not respecting boundaries is what got me here. So do I reach out or not? This is gonna be really helpful for you if you are newly estranged from your child, so if this just happened to you, or if you have been that parent patiently waiting by the phone, just waiting for that call saying, okay, we're ready to meet and talk. What I'm about to share is based on my personal experience, the 10 years of clinical experience that I've gained sitting, like having the honor of sitting with clients on that couch, and also from the insights I've gained from the leading experts in this field, like Dr. Joshua Coleman. This roadmap is not suitable if your adult child has abused you, if you've endured years of mistreatment, if they would definitely fall in the category of having a high conflict personality, this isn't gonna be helpful. What I recommend for you is to try to get your child into like family therapy. So get into family therapy, work on setting healthy boundaries together, really understanding coping mechanisms for when their emotions get intense. That would be your best option. Let's get started. I wanna build a sense of community. Drop the hand emoji. If you're a parent currently estranged from your adult child, drop the hand emoji. I do that because I wanna make sure you know you are not alone. Another reason why I know you're not alone is because one in four families will experience estrangement in America in their lifetime, one in four. That just, when I read that, I I was just like, that can't be right. So I did even more digging and people are, experts are saying they even think it's higher than that because parents are so ashamed to come forward and and report that it is actually happening that they think the number might even be higher than that. However, out of the one in four, the people that do estrange, many reconcile and most that do reconcile are very happy that they did. So I say that to provide hope, even though me saying that goes against the leading expert. Dr. Joshua Coleman is absolutely phenomenal. And he says, it's not healthy for parents to hold out hope. Like you have to come to a place and accept 
you may never reconcile with your child. Like this might be your story. And when I read that at first, it was just like, oh, no, no. And then I read about his philosophy, his theory around it. And I totally understand his premise. His idea is for parents that are totally consumed by the fact that their child has gone no contact or estranged from them, it's like gravy all over their plate. The grief is all consuming, which affects their work, their romantic relationships, the relationships with their other children, the relationships with their grandkids. And by coming to a place of acceptance, then they're able to flourish in other areas of their lives because they can containerize this pain, which I think is really healthy. But I think we can do both. I think you can hold out hope and containerize it with two words. I think you can say, my family is broken right now. This is, this is where my family's at. Like my child doesn't want to see me right now. By adding right now, it punctuates it to this is it for right now. Doesn't mean it's forever. That gives you the hope, but it also containerizes it so that you can go on and still fulfill all your other relationships and still experience joy in your life. Okay, I am about to share something with you and that is our family's estrangement story. And I'm doing this because again, I don't want you to feel like you're alone. So I'm gonna lead and I'm gonna share with you our story. And this is gonna be from the daughter-in-law's perspective. When I use the word boundaries in my story, this is a time in our lives when we didn't understand what a boundary was. We thought a boundary was, we don't like what you're doing, (laughs) stop that. And if we tell you to stop it, if you love us, you'll stop it. So it was all about us telling people like our in-law, my in-laws to change their behavior. And if they didn't change their behavior, that meant they didn't love us. And that's not what a boundary is. We know that a boundary is all about changing our own behavior to keep us safe, balanced, and in relationship with others. So we had it all wrong when this happened. So I wanna preface that. So when I say they crossed all the boundaries, they crossed all the boundaries that we thought was boundaries, but it was definitely misunderstood. Once I share this story with you, I believe you're gonna understand why I'm so passionate about helping daughter-in-laws, mother-in-laws, just families in general, be able to communicate boundaries the right way, the healthy way, um, set boundaries, hold them the way you're supposed to so that we never have to get to this point, which is estrangement. Years ago, my husband Ryan decided to take a little brief break from his parents. They had disrespected him one too many times, crossed one too many boundaries, and hurt him deeply because we had made this parenting decision. It was very hard on us and painful, and we were in a very tough spot, and we thought we were doing the best thing for our child. It was really ill-received. Ill they didn't like it. They said they wouldn't respect it, and they came at us like a wave, and we were very shocked, and because of that, he's like, okay, <laughs> time out. So what he thought was going to be a two-week breather turned into a long, painful two-year estrangement. Right from the start, Ryan asked me to sit back, not meddle, because before, in years past, we had had some rocky parts and run-ins with his parents, again, just crossing lines and really making us feel disregarded, disrespected as parents. And I was always the first one in there just trying to make sure everyone, you know, smooth it all over. And he felt that was hurting him more. And he wanted to break the pattern of his parents always doing this to him. And he asked me to sit back. And I did. And that is my first regret. My in-laws didn't know what to do. They absolutely panicked. Now, I just shared with you where we were, like on our side. But on their side? Oh, God, I can't even get emotional. (laughs) I still have a full episode to do. On their side, their two grandparents that have been involved in our kids' lives since the moment, you know, we announced we're pregnant. And so they're thinking, oh my gosh, like just their grandkids were ripped away from them. They freaked out and they were just trying anything and everything to get back to the kids. They wouldn't listen to Ryan when he was saying, dude, you're being ridiculous. Just look at what you did. We made a parent a decision 
you completely said you would not honor it. You told us like we were wrong and that you were going to bulldoze us and go around us as parents and still do what you wanted with our son, even though we were trying to teach him something. And he, and he's like, how can you can't, how come you can't see what you did? And they kept ignoring him and they just kept talking about the kids. So Ryan finally wrote out a very thoughtful email just saying, this is what happened. This is how it made me feel. And this is what has to happen for us to move forward, which is you have to acknowledge how you made me feel and we have to figure out how this can't happen again. So he sent out the email, waited for a response, and he finally got a response. He clicked it open. And what did it say? When can we see the grandkids? It felt like an absolute dagger in his heart. And so as the weeks kept passing by, they would reach out, when can we see the kids? Ryan would direct them back to the email. When can we see the kids? Please read the email. When can we see the kids? Everything has to happen in the email first. This went on and on and on. And when they were not making any traction, what happened next was the family got involved. So now you have to imagine family watching these two grandparents that have been very much involved in our kids' lives being ripped away from them, they're broken, they're crying, and they're sharing the story of we did nothing wrong, you better imagine the army came after Ryan. So they came after him in droves, made him feel like an awful human being, doing everything they could to make, like, break him down and get him to cave and just give the kids back to the grandparents. And we were just like, oh my God, what is happening here? We're not saying we're taking the kids away from you, and this is only being drawn out because you won't acknowledge the one thing in the email that he's saying to acknowledge. Like we could not fathom what was going on. We really thought we were in a complete different dimension. It was awful. Once that didn't work, so they went after him, that didn't work. So then do you know what happened? They came after me. So even though I had not been a part of this estrangement, they came after me. And not only did they come after me just on my phone, they came after me publicly and I have a business. And <laughs> this is one thing I want to point out. Ryan and I both have businesses online, but they only came after me on my business page online. So publicly they only came after me. And I think it's interesting and it's something to really pull up and highlight because I believe whether you're a mom, um, a mom-in-law, a mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, quickly, you're the scapegoat. So quickly, it's your fault. I think it's natural to blame, it's a default to blame the in-law. So I don't blame my in-laws for blaming me because I think biologically we're wired to do things that can serve our energy. And if we can blame a third party, someone that is, we have no responsibility over, we didn't raise, we didn't instill values, we didn't do anything. They're just an outsider of our family and we don't have to really turn that mirror around and look at what we might have done and expend energy trying to work on ourselves and all that stuff. I think it's way easier to say it's, it's them. So then I got it. It was just the most emotionally charged time. I can't even describe the feeling. If you're going through it, you may know. It's high drama, lots of really intense moments. Things that you would never think would happen are happening because people are just emotionally volatile. Then we had a meeting, actually right here. So I was sitting in this corner right here because Ryan wanted me to. Ryan was sitting on that corner where it says hello. And then his dad was in the, so his mom was where those pillows are, right there. And his dad's right there. So we had a meeting here and it went awful. It went so bad. I don't think it could have went worse. It was so sad because before the meeting, Ryan asked me to sit in that corner because he wanted to be like a buffer between us because I wasn't a part of it. And he wanted to visually show this is between us guys. like. She's never been a part of this. Like, this is between us. But in that meeting, his dad was so angry, you couldn't see his pain, like, through all the anger. Just, like, just, it was just out of every pore. But I, I understood it. 
he was so close, especially to our son. I mean, he just looked at us like these two monsters that pulled away his buddy. And then you have my mother-in-law that's absolutely shattered to pieces, even though they won't acknowledge what they did to Ryan. She's just trying to, in the kindest way possible, move things along, just like glaze over it, how we've always done in the past. And so, yeah, it was a complete disaster. Didn't work well. The only time I did break my promise to Ryan was when we were hugging goodbye. I hugged my mother-in-law. We were crying. And I just said, he just wants you to acknowledge his feelings. That's it. That's all you have to do. I just whispered it to her. They left. Months went by. And we had another holiday season. So this is our second Christmas that we missed. In the second year, I did not attend any meeting. Like Ryan went on two drives with his mom. Felt like he was making a little progress. He went over to their house and had a couple meetings. Felt like he was making some progress. And then because the whole family had gotten involved in such an intense way, which I understand, like they were seeing two grandparents just absolutely in a puddle I get it but because it was a family matter they really wanted to have a family meeting and on the way there that's when I finally said because this would have been if the meeting didn't go well it was days before another Christmas and if that didn't go well that would have been the third Christmas we would have missed like our family would not have been together and so I told Ryan if it starts going haywire like it did in this office I am going to step in and try to help because what you're doing isn't working. My husband aged in, I don't even know if it took two months for it to age him 10 years. He went into a depression. Like, so if you're a parent and you're thinking, I don't even know if this phases my child. It's not the same heartache that you're having, but I can tell you firsthand, your child's going through it. It was awful. So we go into the meeting. It started off very similar to this meeting in here. And then once I could see, they were still back at day one. Like they were still at the spot where, so if if this was like plot A and they had to jump to plot B, which was validating his feelings, they were still at plot A. Like they didn't know how are we supposed to get here? And once I realized all this time, like they just stay, stayed right here, just broken and traumatized by us because they didn't know how to get over here. They didn't know how to do what we were asking, even though, I mean, we even made some jokes a few times, like maybe they're allergic to accountability because we thought Ryan had made it very clear. like this is what you did. You just need to be accountable. And they kept coming back. We didn't do anything wrong. We're not apologizing for something we didn't do. And when I realized all this time, all these memories were wasted, all this pain, all this suffering, the trauma, the trauma, I, I, it was like a sledgehammer. It's like somebody took a sledgehammer and just like slammed it into my stomach. That was a horrible moment. And that's when I realized like all these two needed was help getting to the next lily pad. Once that was done, they were able to acknowledge his feelings. Everybody like apologized. We apologized on our end. You know, Ryan and I both were able to say, we think you're amazing grandparents. Just because there's been some disrespect boundaries crossed and we had this huge incident where we felt so hurt by you that doesn't negate everything you've done yes have we had our stuff have you have you disrespected us and I mean honestly we didn't feel like we were parents to them like in their eyes we felt very disregarded the entire time we were parents with them it that part sucked we never felt like we were doing a good job and that part did suck doesn't mean they weren't good grandparents and so once we could validate that and tell them that doesn't erase all that you've done for us all we wanted was for you to get to the next lily pad and acknowledge him like acknowledge what you were doing to us so that we can learn a different way so we don't have to keep doing this because we've kept doing this 
that was it. But once they realized just because we acknowledge that doesn't make us bad people, that doesn't take away everything we've done, that's when they were able to understand and maybe put themselves in Ryan's shoes and apologize. So we did reconcile that day. We did have Christmas and matching PJs and and that was that. And we've been reconciled ever since. Before we transition into pulling apart the street the three-step process, I really want to make sure you hear me when I say this is something that my husband and I profoundly regret. Had we known what I realized in that moment when I saw in their broken faces that they were still at point A and they just didn't know how to like swim across the channel to get to point B, we would have never, ever, ever done this. We did not know that they were unable for whatever reason to just put themselves in his shoes and just say, even though we don't know or we don't believe we did anything wrong, sitting in your shoes, we can totally see that would have sucked. And we're really sorry. They couldn't do that for whatever reason without some assistance, just without some guidance. So before I go any further, I wanna say, if I could have done anything over besides getting involved, I would have recommended Ryan and his parents go into family therapy right away because a neutral third party would have been able to see, oh, they, they believe that if they accept they did something wrong, that everything they stand for as grandparents is bad. And that's not true. They also, and so to be able to pull that apart, but also that two different realities exist at the same time. Ryan's reality, that's his truth. And my in-laws reality, that's their truth. But if you can understand that they're both right because it's subjective, you can get into the headspace of putting yourself into your child's shoes and saying, oh my gosh, if that's truly how they interpreted my actions, that would have freaking sucked. I'm sorry. Like I never intended to do that. That's what a therapist would help you guys do. Let's transition into the steps and pulling apart the three-step process. So in episode 10, I said to start the path of reunification and healing, you need to get them to crack the door. And I mentioned reaching out every so often, just letting them know that you know, you're thinking about them, you hope they're having a good day, just thinking about your texts. And then every so often, like four to six weeks, you would put an ask in or a reminder, just, just so you know, I'm ready to meet your terms, you know, your turf with your therapist, whatever, I'm ready. And you guys had questions. For the first step, getting them to crack the door, how do you get your adult child enticed enough to crack the door? Like what would be something you could do to prove and demonstrate this time it's gonna be different. Like for us, Ryan had gone through a pattern of disrespect with his parents for so long, it really would have taken his parents to step back and just say, okay, our son has never done anything like this ever. He's never done anything like this before. So obviously we have done something so royally wrong to him for him to think he has to say, go away. What, what could we have done? Is there anything I have contributed to this mess? Like this is a huge thing that our son has done is to say, I, I need a break. So we really need to step back and say, okay, could I have done anything to contribute to this mess. And when you are able to step back, when you step back, you're able to put yourself in their shoes and, you're, and you look at things through their eyes. And if you, if you agree with the fact that there are two realities, every reality is subjective, then you can say, gosh, if that would have happened to me, looking at it through his lens, I can understand that would have felt you know, emasculating, that would have felt dis disrespectful, that would have felt enabling, that would have felt, you know, whatever the feeling is. And then once you have those feelings identified because you truly sat in their shoes, you reach out and you say, hey, Sam, I, 
I want you to know I have really been doing some introspection, like some work here. And I took a step back and I know that even though I swear to you I didn't intend on it, my actions made you feel emasculated. Like when I paid off your car or your credit card debt without checking with you, I thought I was helping, but now that I see it through your lens, you were really proud of the accomplishments and the progress you were making on that, and that was really important to you. And by me just taking over, I can see my error, and I'm really sorry. Boy, that door's gonna crack, right? If you got that message, that door should crack. <laughs> so that is one way to really get your child to realize, oh, this is a different rodeo. Like when we meet, it's not gonna be like this talk. It's gonna be a different talk. It's gonna be a talk where they really truly have put themselves in my shoes. They acknowledged what they have done wrong and they're ready to build healthier boundaries and respect our boundaries once we know what they are. One thing I do wanna mention with step number one, getting the door to crack and the subjective realities, is you might have a case where your adult child has estranged and they have different recollections of their childhood than you do. It's very hurtful, right? Like I remember just the, uh, like the other month, I was like last month maybe, I was sitting by the Christmas tree and my daughter was talking about childhood memories with her boyfriend and basically, you know, I'm, I'm the bad one. And, and I was just listening to her thinking, wow, I would have never perceived any of that that way. And I had no idea she was perceiving it this way. That's so interesting. I mean, crappy, really hard to hear as a parent. And that's her reality. Like that's how she filed it away. And I was like, that is not how it happened at all. But to me, it's because she's saying I did all these things and it made her feel this way. And the reason why I'm feeling like defensive sitting on the couch, not butting in, is because I would never intentionally make my daughter feel that way, so I wanna correct her because I'm feeling misrepresented and misunderstood. However, I also need to honor the fact that that is how she filed it away, that is how she interpreted it, because that is her reality. And I, and I just said, oh wow, Ellie, <laughs> I'm gonna tell ya, it's super hard for me to hear that, but I believe you, like I, I believe that that's how you experienced it, and I'm really sorry. I. I wouldn't have ever wanted you to feel that way. I didn't say, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I said, man, I didn't understand that you would have interpreted it that way. And I want you to know my actions, I, my intention, I never meant for that. But I, I believe that that was your experience. And I'm really sorry. We can do this as parents. We can do this. It sucks, but we can do it. For Ryan's parents, if they would have just said, you know, Ryan, after we stepped back, and thought about it and what it would have been like for you, I mean, what a tough decision that would have been made. Like you made the break a really hard decision as parents to, you know, help your son. And even though we disagreed, we really should have sat back and let you take the lead because you are the parents. And we trust that you are trying to do what's best for your kid. And we didn't do that. And instead, not only didn't we support you on this very painful and tough decision, we went against you and we said we were going to disrespect you and still show up and do exactly what you asked us not to do because you were trying to teach him something. And we're really sorry. That would have been really awful because you have two things going on there, right? If they would have said something like that, and like, can you come over? I'll cook a turkey, I'll cook a turkey right now. <laughs> but they didn't because they didn't know how to do that, but even if they couldn't get to that place and they couldn't say, yeah, what we did was wrong, this is how they could have responded for step two or step one to get the door to crack. They could have said, you have never ever responded this way to us. You have never raised a fuss. You're always super respectful to us. You, you stand up for us whenever there's drama in our family. You're very protective of us. You've never hurt us. And the fact that you have done this tells us something. And so even though we don't agree that we did something wrong, we know we hurt you. And for that, we are so sorry. Can we please meet? That would have worked too. 
I'll put, I'm putting in the turkey. Respecting boundaries while you're asking for a meeting. This is a very huge, huge thing that I'm sure a lot of you are worried about. And Coleman talks extensively about this. Basically, if let's say your son Sam has said, don't come over, like stop coming over, we are not ready to talk. I would message and say, Sam, dad and I are gonna respect your boundary and we are not gonna show up, we're not coming over. We just wanna let you know, we've really taken a step back. We understand where we have gone wrong, you know, and then kind of fill in the blank a little bit, identify the feeling that he would be feeling because you put, him, put yourself in Sam's shoes and just say, we really want to talk about this in person. Please let us know when you're ready to meet. We'll meet anywhere, anytime, and on your terms. Love you, mom and dad. Coleman also suggests that you ask for what kind of communication your child prefers. So if you have an estrangement going on, he says, you need to ask, you know, how do you want me to contact you? Which I totally understand what he's trying to do. Because he's trying to say, you're trying to demonstrate you are an individual, you have autonomy, and I am respecting your boundaries. Tell me what you prefer. What I have experienced personally with my husband and his estrangement, what I have experienced with adult children and parents sitting on my couch trying to reunite, I believe there's a conflicting message with this dynamic because you have the kids saying, back off, you're overbearing, but in the same breath, they say, you're the parent, you need to fix it. That's a tough one. I have seen adult kids tell their parents, you should be reaching out, you're the mom. You should be reaching out, you're the dad. For Ryan's mom, oh, you guys, she did such a beautiful job with this. And this is what happened. So uh, sometimes twice a week, sometimes twice a month, she would send Ryan photos of happy times, of places they've been together, just memories, kind of reminding him, like, I'm not all bad, I'm still here, I love you. And, and she did this so well. Now, when a message would come, you would tear my husband up. You'd have a bad day because the guilt would just crush him. I mean, you could just see it all over his body. He just felt awful because he's hurting his mom. Even though it affected him that way, on the weeks that she missed, he would come to me every week. He would come to me every time she would miss and he would say, well, I think that's it. I think my mom has given up. And he was just like this little boy, like broken little boy. And then he would get a text the next week. And what I attribute this to, if you remember, being a teenager with all the hormones, all the moods, like me, and you get mad at your parents and you, you stomp off and you slam the door and then you wait. You wait for the knock. Sweetie, can I come in? No, I hate you. <laughs> no, stay away, whatever it is. But on those moments where you stomp into your room, you slam the door, and no knock comes, you open that door back up and you're like, you don't even care about me, right? Because you want that, they want them to pursue you. You want them to come tend to your pain like it's a scraped knee. You want mom and dad to, sweetie, I'm here. And so I believe this is really important to remember because just what I witness is that Kids, adult kids still want to hear that knock at the door and they still want to have the control of saying, no, don't come in. I'm not ready. But it's a comfort knowing that, you know, they're standing outside the door. Another example I have is I have adult kids that, you know, they've estranged and they'll come in. Oh, they'll gripe about the text messages. Oh, it's so annoying that my parents keep messaging me. I never message back. But one thing I think is really interesting, they never block them. They don't block them. And I never bring it up because I don't want to give them any ideas. I don't want them to think they have to prove anything. But I think even though they're estranged, whenever they get that message, it feels like a knock at the door. So even though Coleman is saying, 
ask for whatever kind of communication they would like. I believe, and this is my personal promise, if this happened to me based on what I've experienced on this couch, based on what I watched with my husband, based on what I feel in my gut, if my son that I had in my belly estranged from me, I would never stop reaching out. I would never stop reaching out. I mean, the, the moment I stopped would be my last breath. Now they wouldn't all be, <laughs> you know, when are we going to meet? <laughs> when are we going to meet? They would be messages like, thinking of you, hope you're having fun. Like, I can't believe it's your 21st birthday. I, want, I can only imagine what you're doing. It would be similar to what my mother-in-law did because I think she aced that she did such a good job and then every four to six weeks I would say like I can't even imagine what you're doing I would say I'm I'm here I'm ready to meet like just tell me I'm sorry I'm getting emotional it is such a I think it's double layered I feel so bad for what we put my in-laws through but I also feel so bad because I know you're watching right now and you're feeling what I can imagine what I would feel as a mom and I'm really sorry I had to be right back get it together right oh my gosh okay so that is just my personal opinion take it however you want you know your child I would not stop because what else am I going to do it's my child what else am I going to do like my life is about making memories with my family. And if I don't have my family, yep, I'll still make memories, but it's not going to be the same. And so there's nothing else I would, I would never, I would never, ever stop trying. Once those doors open and you finally have your meeting, drop everything, leave your ego at the door, literally drop everything. Go to wherever they want to meet. They want to bring their therapist, their minister, go. Get to the meeting, but don't bring your ego. Start off the meeting by showing them, if you haven't already, but even reiterate, we are so sorry. We have put ourselves in your shoes. We understand the way that you experienced our actions and how it made you feel, and we're so sorry. We're here to really learn, and we wanna hear your side. We wanna listen and grow from this. We wanna understand your boundaries. So please, will you talk, tell us, everything like just share your story with us we want to listen so at the meeting once you tell them right away i see you i hear you i understand you and i never meant to hurt you i'm sorry let me hear your story now let me hear more of you let me understand more sit and listen listen more than you try to talk and explain and whatever you do try best to like put a stake in the ground and not get pulled out into the weeds of the details. Don't argue if you were in the kitchen or not. Don't argue if you even showed up at that event. Don't argue about anything. Just listen for the feelings they would have felt in their reality, because that's, what, that's their truth. What would that have been like for them? And that's how you respond. So when they're telling you these stories and things that you're just like, that is not how I remember it. Stick with being a detective and sitting in their shoes and being like, gosh, if this was anyone else but my child and that was happening to them, what would I feel? Oh, that would feel awful. And then you say, oh, Sam, that would have felt awful. I am so sorry. Here's a pro tip. If you see a lot of anger from your child coming at you, do not meet that. So the more anger you see, that's how much pain is underneath. So when I saw my father-in-law sitting there and I could feel like it was so incredibly uncomfortable because he was so angry, I could feel it and see it. I knew how much hurt he was in because of how much anger he was showing. So if your child is that, so then just keep going for the tender emotions. I know this had to have been devastating for you. I know this had to have been disrespectful for you. I am so sorry. Just keep chipping it down 
so that once they feel seen, heard, and understood and validated, they can calm down from their anger. And anger is just a protective shield, right? Because they don't want you to see all the pain. It's also a pain reliever. When you feel angry, it does release a chemical that numbs the pain a little bit. But just really, when you see that anger, don't meet it with anger. Really start to identify the softer feelings of what they would have felt in that moment to try to tame them down. Step three, if you probably all remember this because it sounds so ridiculous to, to be a step, but I'm telling you, it prolongs a lot of estrangements. And that is, don't bring up the grandkids. What led to this estrangement, even if it was disrespect around their parenting, around a boundary around the, the grandkids, don't bring up seeing the grandkids. It makes your adult child and it makes their partner feel in insignificant, like they don't matter. It hurts them. It's still your baby. Don't, don't do that. Whatever you do in that meeting, make them feel seen, heard, understood. Make clear boundaries. Make sure you ask all the clarifying questions you need. And when you leave that meeting, don't bring up the grandkids. And trust me, it shouldn't take longer than two weeks of you abiding by the, the newly identified boundaries before you get an invite to go to McDonald's with the grandkids, to come over to the house and see the kids, something. Coleman does a really good job of reminding parents to really manage your expectations. It's going to take a while to heal. So even though you reconcile, healing and rebuilding that trust is going to take time. One thing parents will often ask me is, how long do I need to be in purgatory? Like, does this ever end? Like, am I just the worst parent ever forever? I don't believe so because I don't believe that your child is a sociopath. I believe that once your child feels seen, heard, and understood, like you truly get it and they feel validated, They'll move on. They don't like to beat a dead horse. Like nobody likes that. And so just remind yourself. So when you start to feel overwhelmed, like, when will this end? I'm getting impatient. Tell yourself, I'm going to do this for as long as it takes because I know once they feel he seen, heard, and understood, we'll be able to move forward because they won't need to keep bringing up all this stuff. What you can do in the interim. So while you're waiting for the door to crack, while you're waiting for the meeting, while you're just waiting for the family to completely heal, what I suggest is get your own therapist. Get a therapist. I am obviously biased, but I think a marriage, a licensed marriage and family therapist is the best in this scenario because we're, tra we're trained in systems theory, which means we think about everybody in the family. We think about everybody that influences you, impacts you, and how people are going to be impacted by your actions and vice versa. It's very much like everyone's in the picture versus individualistic. Once you get on speaking terms, so when you're speaking but you're still on the path of healing, I would not ask for recommendations from your adult child, but I would mention, hey, so I'm listening to the Mind Your Boundaries podcast. I've read all of Dr. Coleman's books. But now I'm looking for something else. Do you have any recommendations, people that you like that I should maybe check out? It shows them that you're really interested in learning and growing, but don't go up to them without any, like, this is what I've already done and I'm really open to your suggestions. You, want, you don't want them to feel like you're saying, lay this out, do the work for me. So just say, I'm, I'm doing this, I've read this, but now I'm kind of looking for some more suggestions. Do you have any? It also shows them that you care and you trust their input. If you fall, like we discussed in episode 10, if you fall in the realm of being that helicopter parent, you really need to work on establishing your own identity, getting into the community more, join a knitting club, you know, get your person, like get a personal therapist, work on who am I? What do I want to focus on? What goals do I want to accomplish? My own personal legacy. Something other than being a mom or a dad. And so really focus in on what can fill your cup and, and occupy your mind more than your children so that there's not so much pressure. Some of you might be wondering, why are the grandkids a part of this? If this is a, a thing between me and my adult child or me and my in-law, 
why are the grandkids a part of this? For us in particular, Ryan knew intuitively, like as long as they had access to the kids, he would not stand a chance, like he would not be their priority. And they would have no reason to try to fix things or understand him. He thought that was the best way to do it because without that, once they got the kids, they would have just ignored his pain. Let's review. Step one, getting them to crack the door. That's all about showing them that you have self-reflected, took a step back, really put yourself in their shoes. You, if you can acknowledge and you know, acknowledge your feelings and say an apology, that will really show them, okay, things are gonna be different this time and they're gonna inch forward towards a meeting. How you keep showing like and sh keep trying to get them to crack that door for the meeting is about every seven to 10 days, just send a nice, I, I'm thinking of you text. And then every four to six weeks, I would send a, a direct message about, hey, I just wanna remind you, I'm ready to talk, I'm ready to meet your terms, your therapist, just let me know. And then go back to, I'm thinking of you text, Step two, the meeting, make sure you really sit down right away. You checked your ego at the door and you make them feel seen, heard, and understood. And then do less talking and more listening. Really focus on the feelings and not the details. And remember that the two realities do exist. Their reality is their truth. Your reality is your truth. Step number three, and this is throughout the whole process, don't bring up the grandkids. Don't bring up the grandkids and just trust that once your child and their significant other, if they're involved, feels seen, heard, and understood, you're gonna get that invite. I truly hope this was helpful and I look forward to reading your comments and your feedback and let me know where we should go next in this topic. And until we meet again, make sure you mind your boundaries.